Nearly a thousand journalists have died in the line of duty, and more than half were killed covering events here in Asia in the last 10 years. However, most were murdered. It's an alarming trend one group hopes to highlight, along with a special journalist memorial in the United States, listing the names of those who've died. We examine what it takes to get the news out, and we'd like to warn you that you may find some of the pictures in this report disturbing. Your heart is racing, your adrenaline's running. In some ways, there's part of you that feels like it's a game. Uh, in other ways, you're absolutely terrified. And you're just in a panic that you'll never get out of this alive. Indelible moments and images. I also got a death threat, and my office really informed me about it. But I, I didn't stop writing about the story. A test of determination. I saw a case where the names of four Sri Lankan journalists are among those who have been listed. Now these four happen to be the camera crew of the state-run uh, of the state-run television. These four were brutally murdered. From covering corruption to conflicts, journalists are out in the trenches, some literally to get the stories and pictures out. But the media are finding themselves under siege, with a growing number being targeted and killed in the line of duty. In the last two years, it's been particularly bad. There were uh, more than 90 journalists killed in uh, 1993, I think it was, was the worst year. And in 1995, there were another 51. And so the numbers have been rising, and this trend to target journalists is new. And uh, I think it's uh, scary to many people who work in the profession. There are different reasons uh, in different parts of the world, but it's a new trend where uh, journalists are actually being murdered instead of just caught in the crossfire of a hostile situation. That scenario was captured all too well in 1985. Uh, this is the events um, where Neil Davis uh, was covering in, in Thailand when he was actually killed. Uh, this is part of a, the, the actual raw footage that uh, was shot by his camera. Gary Fairman is the Hong Kong bureau chief for the American network NBC. He was Neil Davis's replacement after the legendary cameraman and his partner were senselessly killed. You actually see where he uh, falls in front of the camera after the tanks just keep on firing. Good gun! Good gun! I mean, they wave the, wave the white flag and so no doubt who they are, and um, they just mowed them down. You can see that they just, you know, shot another bullet and just missed them again. This was Gary Burns, a man that dragged him, got on the plane and, and, and said, that's it. It was, it was his best friend. What happened to um, the soldiers? Well, they, they were captured a few years later um, after you know, things settled down and uh, they were put to trial, but they were let off, uh, given a pardon, even though it was well known that these were the soldiers that, uh, and the, the, the uh, guys that were in the tank that uh, killed him. Since the mid-80s, the number of journalists killed while on assignment has increased, along with threats to keep stories from making headlines. I criticized a, a military operation that was done by the army then. As a result of all that exposure, I became a target. And uh, the leadership was out to kill me. They were trying to kidnap my four-year-old daughter. There's really a pretty concerted effort by uh, a number of politicians and uh, gov leading government figures in South Asia to uh, really keep a handle on the way they're portrayed in the media, and this is a, an alarming trend given the history of press freedom in much of Asia. It's, it's very difficult to generalize what's happening in Asia, but you do have an increasing uh, tendency towards repression. While cultural factors may make a difference out on the field, competition to break stories and into the business can lead to life-threatening gambles. There were seven in Asia. The Asian, um, the Asian psyche uh, is such that uh, there's a lot of face involved, and uh, it's spontaneous. The, uh, the 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 reaction to uh, if you confront them and uh, and and confrontation is is is, is spontaneous. I think that uh, 
you find yourself in a, in a, in a situation and you just can't talk your way out. When uh, a journalist is killed in 24 hours, um, uh, one of them was a friend of mine, and the rest of them I just, I just knew. But uh, that's, uh, that's not the first time that happened, and it probably won't be the last. Yeah, I mean, it's John Steele, you can say, has filmed it all, from Things the crisis happen. in Kigali to conflicts in and Bosnia and Russia. Right There's the other element of war is complete and utter madness, and there, there is an element of chance to it. When you go into these situations, you, you go into them with terror in your heart, because you do know that you may not come out alive. There is that chance that you may not come out alive. But at that particular point, all I really cared about was just getting the best pictures I could to tell the story, um, getting as close as I could, and um, getting as many pictures that could actually get across what was happening personally. But the industry is changing, along with motivations in getting a story. There are other people that get what they call the disease, the bug. They consider themselves invincible. They consider themselves war junkies. They have got to go everywhere. You were mentioning earlier about the two crazies. Who are they? Well, crazy and crazy, as they became nicknamed, were two um, Russian producers who won this accolade because of their bravery, some would say their foolhardy behavior in a number of conflicts in the former Soviet Union. They each had a small video camera and they would work as freelance producers, cameramen in the most appalling war zones of the former Soviet Union. And some situations call for more than just filming and reporting. They send us out uh, in teams to uh, Aldershot Air Force Base in uh, Britain and it's a three-day course, uh, a three, four-day course in battlefield medical training. We know emergency battlefield uh, medical procedures to keep someone alive for 36, 48 hours. Have you ever had to use it? Um, twice, yeah, but never on a member of my team. One son of a soldier in uh, Georgia whose legs have been blown apart and uh, in the middle of the battle. And uh, once in uh, Kigali during the slaughters where uh, we came across a ditch and uh, there was a little boy lying. It was hundreds of people dead, and we found one boy who was still alive. And it's those kinds of experiences the Freedom Forum wants to keep alive. While in the territory for the first of a series of forums on the dangers of reporting, it unveiled plans for a museum near Washington, D.C., devoted to news gathering and the dedication in May of a memorial for those killed on assignment. The only place in the world where the names of all of the journalists who have been killed in the line of duty will be honored and remembered. Outside the news museum, uh, there will be a memorial to all the journalists who have died around the world. Uh, more than 900 names are on it. Uh, there are many names from Asia. The contributions of Neil Davis and 239 others who lost their lives in Asia are to be remembered as the Freedom Forum's awareness campaign picks up momentum. Hong Kong is one place where the dangers reporters face around the world are being highlighted. But the campaign doesn't stop here. It'll continue on to London, South Africa, and South America. Right. Meanwhile, back at the NBC office, a piece of TV history is kept for now. This is it. What normally happens uh, to a camera? We're trying to that? we're trying to find something to do with this. We're we're not sure. I mean, it would be nice to put put items like this in in some way that people could view them. Neil's film cameras from his Vietnam days are actually in the War Memorial in Australia, in Canberra. This camera was found by a Japanese crew that was uh, wanting wanting to do a story about Neil Davis himself and actually came down and, and, and filmed the camera itself. You used this camera after... Uh... After Neil, I used it, and, and I had uh, an accident in, in, in Tiananmen Square on, on the second night of the, the uprising there, and, um, and, I and I broke the camera, it fell on it. And then it got sent back to New York, and it ended up in our storage and, and warehouse in New York. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when the Japanese came through and wanted to sort of make a documentary about Neil. Mm -hmm. They wanted 
to see the camera, so I got it shipped out here. And I've kept the camera it is because I, I, I'm really sort of hesitant to give it up um, as, it, as I used it in his footsteps. And uh, I, I want it to go somewhere that it's you know, going to be uh, sort of not discarded in a few years' time. Thank <laughs> you.